it is a, it's a great honor to be here at the Colloquium. Uh, I'm doubly honored to be here as the guest of honor. Looking at the caliber of the other guests, I feel like a preposterous fraud, but uh, still a uh, great pleasure and great privilege. Um, I had a weird experience writing this talk because um, like literally the day before we travel, I completely dismantled it, changed the structure around um, so that it ends in a different place from where it did originally. Um, it's, a, it's a strange sort of collection of stuff, as you'll see. Um, but I did keep the original title, uh, which is Speak of the Dazzling Wings, Myth, Language, and Modern Fantasy. Speak of the Dazzling Wings uh, is actually a line from a poem written by Wallace Stevens, which I first read 30 years ago. I steal a lot of stuff from Wallace Stevens for two reasons. Um, first of all, because he was a bona fide genius, and second, he's dead. So <laughs> there isn't really a whole hell of a lot he can do about it. Um, unless there's an afterlife for writers, in which case I'm in a shitload of trouble. Um, so there, there are two or three Stevens poems in the mix here. Uh, a little bit of T.S. Eliot, and a couple of recent psychological studies that I happen to read. Um, some anthropology and sociology, most of it quite old, and a fair bit of fantasy, um, some of it fairly new, some of it 100 years old. Um, all of this is either going to add up to one single mind-bending insight, or it's going to be the kind of unholy mess that you will need drugs and therapy to help you recover from. And if any of you have any drugs with you, um, and you want to self-medicate in the course of the talk, then it, it may help. <laughs> if, it, if, it, if, it does, if it does all fall apart on us, then I will owe each and every one of you a drink. So the next time you meet, just sidle up to me and say, I was with you that time in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> I'll know what you mean, and I'll set you up with a pint of your, your own choosing. Um, some of the language stuff referred to in the, in the title that related to the work of Alan Barfield, um, one of the Inklings, the one of the Inklings who didn't write fantasy. You know, he was uh, in that group that included Charles Williams, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, C.S. Lewis. Uh, he was a philosopher. But it kind, of, it kind of got squeezed out of the mix, so um, you could ask me about that in the Q&A if you wanted to. That would be a softball question. So, can fantasy function in a mythic mode? Can fantasies be myths or borrow from myths? And if they can, should they? Um, Tolkien obviously felt that the answer to those questions was yes, they could and they should. Um, because when he was asked for a comment on uh, his fellow inkling C.S. Lewis's work in the Narnia books, he tore strips off them. He complained that Lewis was insufficiently mythic in his approach to the Narnia books. And his chief complaint was that Lewis just borrowed the furniture of other myths, specifically uh, the Christ myth, the story of Christ's death and resurrection, and built his books around an allegory of that myth. Uh, the king over the water is God, Aslan is Christ. He drives, dies to redeem the sinner, Edmund, who sold his forfeit to the white witch, Satan, on account of his sins. Uh, etc., etc. This isn't how you do it. This isn't how you're meant to do it, Tolkien said. You should create your own myths, which stand on their own terms, which arguably is what he does in The Lord of the Rings. In true, the further you get into the song, really, and the more like Satan Sauron uh, seems to be. But um, for all his sufferings, nobody ever mistook uh, Frodo Baggins for the risen Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so fantasy has myth in its DNA, we could say. Tolkien is a founder member of the club. He's one of the writers most directly responsible for defining the genre complex of modern fantasy. And the whole time he was writing, he was looking back over his shoulder um, at Beowulf, at the Norse Eddas, and so on. Um, there are obviously other cultural strands that feed into the development of modern fantasy, folklore, travelers' tales, and the fantasy field as it exists now owes a lot to military history, um, hardball detective fiction, and so on and so forth, more than it does to Beowulf, arguably. But myth is there at the birth of the genre, at the outset. But I think it's relevant to ask, in what capacity is it there? Um, does myth inform content, approach, sensibility? Or does it just provide a formal model that is worth, um, worth plundering, worth borrowing from? Here's a piece of fantasy that I happen to love. It dates from 1905. It's the opening of The Gods of Pagana by the Irish fantasist Edward Morton Plunkett, better known as Lord Dunsany. Before there stood gods upon Olympus, or ever Allah was Allah, had wrought and rested Mana Yud Sushai. There are in Pagana Mung and Sish and Kib, and the maker of all small gods, who is Mana Yud Sushai. 
Moreover, we have a faith in ruin and slip. And it has been said of old that all things that have been were wrought by the small gods, excepting only Mana Yusushai, who made the gods and hath thereafter rested. And none may pray to Mana Yusushai, but only to the gods whom he hath made. But at the last will Mana Yusushai forget to rest and will make again new gods and other worlds and will destroy the gods whom he hath made. And all the gods and all the worlds shall depart and there shall be only Mana Yusushai. In the midst before the beginning, fate and chance cast lots to decide whose the game should be. And he that won strode through the mist to Mama Yusushai and said, Now make gods for me, for I have won the cast and the game is to be mine. But who it was that won the cast, and whether it was fate or whether chance that went through the mist before the beginning to Mama Yusushai, none knoweth. One of the things I love about this as a creation story is that it really lets you have your cake and eat it. Albert Einstein, Werner Heisenberg, determinism or randomness, does God play dice? Maybe or maybe not, but he did toss a coin once. Um, but this is definitely a piece of writing that announces itself as a myth. It's about the creation of the universe, it's got gods in it, and it's written in deliberately archaic language. But is it actually a myth? I, I would argue that it isn't, uh, not because it's too recent, but because um, its intention and its effect on the reader are completely different from that of myth. It's a, it's a jeu d'esprit, it's a verbal game, or to put it even more bluntly, it's a mind fuck. <laughs> you applaud it for its cleverness, you applaud it for its verbal elegance, but you're not invited to invest in it emotionally. It doesn't change you or move you. You don't have to believe in it, and neither did the person who wrote it. Um, he's creating an entertainment for us, and that's all he's doing. Um, I love the gods of Pagana, but I still see it as kind of a, a slight piece of work, kind of frivolous. It's using myth as a formal model, but it's a pastiche. That's all it is. It is a very, very good pastiche. Um, in case I'm accused at this point of taking cheap shots, Exhibit B, urban fantasy fiction, specifically my own um, Felix Castor novels. Castor is an exorcist, but he's an exorcist in a kind of Raymond Chandler, noirish style. He wears a trench coat, he walks the mean streets, he does it for the money. And this is in a London where the dead have started to rise in large numbers and in a variety of different forms, ghosts, werewolves, zombies, and so on. Everything except vampires. Well, most of those entities aren't, aren't from myth, they're from folklore, obviously. This is a bestiary for the fireside on a winter's night. It's not for the temple, um, days of ritual enactment. But Castor also meets succubi uh, and other assorted demons, which are transplanted from a Judeo-Christian context. So as with Lewis's Narnia books, where you meet fairies and dwarves and talking animals, along with that, um, that Christ surrogate, I guess the Castor books have a bastard ancestry that includes myth as well as folklore. But when you look at the story mechanics of the Castor novels, you can see that I don't come within a million miles of myth. And I think there are a lot of other, this is true, a lot of other urban fantasies as well. Vampires with mortgages, teenage gods and goddesses, zombies who try to run cinema franchises. Um, <laughs> one of my main characters is the succubus called Adjula Sikale. Well, she, she shortens that to Julia. Succubi are sex demons. They're first mentioned in the Jewish mystical text, the Zohar. Um, their method of feeding involves filling a man with sexual desire and then eating him, body and soul, in the course of lovemaking. But my succubus, because she can't get it on with a man without sort of getting carried away and eating him, uh, she, she's chosen to enter into a long-term lesbian relationship, which is very, it to be very rewarding and, and uh, uh, sustaining. But she frets about the fact that her lover, Susan Bork, has to go out to work for a living. She doesn't like that. Um, so this is a mythical creature having to endure the day-to-day -day stresses and strains of a relationship, and that, that's sort of the point of the situation. I think a lot of urban fantasies are actually, if you look at them closely, not myths, but anti-myths. Claude Lavin Levi strauss said that a true myth is set in the distant past, but it explains the present and the future. A lot of urban fantasies, including mine, I think, are set in the present, and they unravel and deconstruct the past. They take all the wind out of the sails of the timeless, the superhuman, the numinous, and they bring it into the present world, the world of our, our experience in a kind of uh, spectacular shipwreck. Or maybe that is a myth for our time. You know, perhaps the growth of secularism in the last two centuries, the disappearance of a framework of belief in a supernatural realm that stands above our own world, requires anti-myths. Perhaps we're moved to tell the story of our own loss of faith and to draw from it the last vestiges of power that a lost belief can have, which is like the mild freeze on breaking a taboo. Um, 
to take potent ideas from a mythic context or a folkloric context that once upon a time could have moved us and, and shaken us, and then to ironically undermine those ideas by welding them to a contemporary reality. There's something there that speaks to us. It's a, it's, in some ways, it's kind of like a commentary on the beliefs of the past, a, a meta-myth. So is, is transcendence, is true myth beyond our reach? Are we, are we kind of post-myth in the same way that we're post-modern? I don't, I don't think we are. Some of my favorite writers of speculative fiction, I believe, are still capable of writing in a mythopoeic mode, um, by which I mean relocating the reader in the world, changing our alignment to the rest of reality. Um, China Miegel, in the Battle Lag novels, which I was writing about this morning, um, especially the third of those novels, Iron Council. Ted Chang, in some of his short stories, especially the story of your life and exhalation. Ursula Le Guin, in Always Coming Home, um, and in a lot of her other stuff. And um, not such a contemporary reference, but uh, Jean Wolfe, in um, Book of the New Sun. This is a passage from The Citadel of the Autarch, which is the last volume of the Book of the New Sun. Uh, Wolf's hero, Severian, who is also the narrator, has been on a colossal journey across the face of the far future world in which he lives. And he's been carrying with him uh, a religious relic, the claw of the conciliator, which is an actual claw, um, seems to be part of a, a, a living being, at the heart of a blue gem. And it has the power to heal wounds. It even has the power to bring the dead back to life. Um, and at the end of his journey, Severian comes back to the city of his birth, Nessus, approaching it from the sea. <clears throat> By the time the shadows were short, I was tired. My face and my wounded leg pained me. I had not eaten since noon of the previous day, and had not slept, save for my trance in the Ascian tent. I would have rested if I could, but the sun was warm, and the line of cliffs beyond the beach offered no shade. At last I followed the tracks of a two-wheeled cart, and came to a clump of wild roses growing from the dune. There I halted, and seated myself in their shadow, to take off my boots and pour out the sand that had entered their splitting seams. A thorn caught my forearm and broke from the branch, remaining embedded in my skin with a skull a drop of blood, no bigger than a grain of millet, at its tip. I plucked it out, then fell to my knees. It was the claw. The claw, perfect, shining, black, just as I had placed it under the altar stone of the pelerines. All of that bush and all the other bushes growing with it were covered with white blossoms and these perfect claws. The one in my palm flamed with transplendent light as I gazed at it. No one can explain such things. Since I have come to the House Absolute, I have talked with the Hector and with various priests, but they have been able to tell me very little, save that God has chosen before this to manifest himself in plans. What struck me on the beach, and it struck me indeed so that I staggered as a blow, was that if the eternal principle had rested in that thorn that I had carried about my neck across so many leagues, and if it now rested in the new thorn I had only now put there, that it might rest in anything, and in fact probably did rest in everything, in every thorn, on every bush, in every drop of water in the sea. The thorn was a sacred claw because all thorns were sacred claws. The sand in my boot was sacred sand because it came from a beach of sacred sand. The Cenobites treasured up the relics of the saints because the saints had approached God, but everything had approached and even touched God, because everything had dropped from his hand. Everything was a relic, all the world was a relic. I drew off my boots that had traveled with me so far and threw them into the waves that I might not walk shod on holy ground. If myth is a function or an effect rather than just a form or a structure that we draw on, then that story for me is a myth, because it's a story that changes our perceptions of the world, our relationship to the world. It's a fictional world, okay? But then when you're reading a story and you're intensely engaged with it, the fictional world is the world that you're living in, arguably. This story reaffirms connections that are sometimes lost in the maelstrom of everyday experience, and it creates them in the course of describing them. So Varian's holy relic turns out to be not the exception, but the rule. It's holy not because it comes from heaven, but because it comes from earth where everything is equally precious just by virtue of its creation and its existence. Everything that lives is holy. William Blake tells us in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, just words. But a myth, whether it's Blake's poem or Gene Wolfe's novel, makes those words true in the act of saying them. Um, this is where I come to speak of the dazzling wind, the, the Walter Stevens poem that I quote in the title of this talk. Uh, the poem is actually called Some Friends from Pascagoula. And Stevens wrote it in 1943 in the death of the Second World War. 
And it's about exactly this. It's about the need for story. The narrator pleads for or demands a story from two other people, two of his friends, presumably. And like a child, he knows exactly what it is that he wants. He's very, very specific. Tell me more of the eagle, Cotton, a new black sly. Tell me how he descended out of the morning sky. Describe with deepened voice and noble imagery his slowly falling round down to the fishy sea. Here was a sovereign sight, fit for a kinky clan. Tell me again of the point at which the flight began. Say how his heavy wings spread on the sun bronzed air to end tip and tip away down to the sand, the glare of the pine trees edging the sand, dropping in sovereign rings out of his fiery lair. Speak of the dazzling wings. What's interesting about Speak of the Dazzling Wings is that it's a request that fulfills itself. In asking for the description, in asking for the capturing of that perfect moment, the speaker is actually supplying it at the same time. The poem is self-enacting. And I think this is probably also true of the stories that we call myths. They seem to describe something, or they seem to explain something to us, but they don't. They actually create in the audience and in the world the thing that they seem to describe. They're magic, and the specific class of magic that they are is incarnation. They bring something eternal down into the human world. I should say at this point, I'm speaking as an atheist. Um, I'm not as an atheist. Uh, so when I say something eternal, I, the reason why I'm avoiding the word divine is because I don't believe in a personalized God. But if you have a God, then the word divine would also do. I'm going to switch from fantasy to myth here to try to prove my point. In the 19th century, it was common to look at myth as something that kind of plugged a uh, cognitive deficit for primitive man, for primitive humanity, um, plugged a gap in their thought. Where the first humans had myth, we now have science because we're better than they were, or we have religion, or as Levi Strauss suggests, maybe a bit mischievously, we have politics. <laughs> but by this view, yeah, we, we just got better kit than they used to have. We got better minds equipped with better ideas. Uh, we've got scalpels, they had pointy sticks. They wanted to understand the world around them, and they did the best they could in their primitive way, groping towards an explanation, but oh, bless them, you know, they just didn't have the conceptual tools to do the job. So myth is like an Ikea desk that's got three legs and no drawers, or it's like an instruction manual for a desk written by someone that's never seen a desk and doesn't really know what they're for, so obviously the results are going to be a little bit quaint. How did the universe get started? Well, the goddess of the sea begat the earth and the sky. Or the god Ymir formed out of melting ice and gave birth via his armpits to the primordial frost giants. Or God said, let there be light. <laughs> Bless. <laughs> no, no. We know there was, there was this bang, right? And it was big. You don't need to invoke God when you've got a bang of that size. <laughs> then in the 20th century, things change. There's a, there's a, there's a a shift in perspective. It doesn't start with Levi Strauss, but Levi Strauss becomes its poster boy. In his book, Structural Anthropology, what he tries to do is to make a value-free assessment of how belief systems function in a whole range of societies, of which our own is, is definitely one. So he doesn't see myth as something that only primitive communities had access to and had recourse to. He sees it as something universal, something that's intrinsic to our common humanity. And he's writing in the 1970s, Structural Anthropology, I think, is. 1973. But from the turn of the 20th century onwards, a lot of people were starting to see and to write about a sickness, a malaise in our own society, a deficit in our perceptions or in our lived experiences, which divorces us from our roots in the world. And that's the basis of the whole modernist movement, a sense of spiritual emptiness and meaninglessness, being cut adrift from the certainties that have made life bearable for, for earlier generations. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. T.S. Eliot, uh, in 1922, giving the modern era its most enduring metaphor, the wasteland. This is where we live. When Marxists talk about alienation, when existentialists talk about, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, contingence, um, these are loosely related terms for a mental and spiritual state which is characterized by absence. Absence of faith, absence of love, absence of redemption, absence of meaning. In a lot of his poems, Wallace Stevens talked about that state and he called it poverty. These are some lines from a poem called Chakoro to its neighbor, 1943. There lies the misery, 
the coldest coil that grips the center, the actual bite, that life itself is like a poverty in the space of life. So that the flapping of wind around me here is something in tatters that I cannot hold. And in another poem, he complains that we exist at the edge of the world, we can't get to the center, the center is barred from us. So in that formulation, in that way of looking at human experience, um, the human condition is, is one of unfulfilled longing, it's one of bereavement or disinheritance. And for Stevens particularly, what separates us from the world more than anything else is our own minds, our own consciousness, which is where I start bumping into some of the things that Peter was talking about this morning. Stephen sees us as being dragged away from reality, abstracted into mazes of memory uh, and anticipation, imagination, desire, theory. We can't find our way back to what is real. We don't even know where it is anymore. The price of having a mind is that you have to live in it. When we were animals, we could live in the world, but we're not animals and we can't go home again. We can't get back to that state of, because we have the curse of self-awareness upon us. And once, once that conception takes hold, that, that idea of our state of mind, our predicament, then we come to be a bit more respectful, or at least maybe a bit more sentimental, about the state of mind that we used to call primitive. We come to appreciate that there may be an upside to a primitive state. When Joni Mitchell says that we've got to get ourselves back to the garden, she doesn't mean, you know, let's go have a picnic and take advantage of the sunny weather while we've still got it. She means we've got to find the primitive, the innocent, the unspoiled inside ourselves. We've got to turn back time and recover something that we've lost. Is that maybe what myth is for? Is this part of what myth does for us or what myth did for the generations that preceded us? Did it heal the breach for our forefathers and foremothers? between them and the world? Or did they not have that breach because they were primitive and they had natural rhythm? Um, an example may help us to answer this question. There was a goddess once, sometime, never. Her name was Persephone. She was the daughter of Demeter, the goddess of fertility and growth. And one day when she was picking flowers in a field along with a bunch of other maidens, a cleft in the earth opened up and the god Hades burst forth. And he was obsessed with Persephone, he was in love with her. So he carried her down to his own gloomy realm, the world of the dead, and kept her there as his consort. And meanwhile, because Demeter mourned for her daughter, everything that grew on the earth withered and died, until finally Zeus was forced to act. He sent um, Hermes down into the underworld to retrieve Persephone. But before she left Hades' realm, she ate some of Hades' food, six pomegranate seeds, and the fates had decreed that whoever ate at Hades' table had to live in Hades' realm. That was just the law. There was no getting around it. But they managed to reach a compromise. Persephone would spend six months of each year in Hades' realm and six, six months of the year above, above, the, uh, above the ground in the mortal world. You don't need to be an anthropologist to get that on one level, at least this is a story about the cycle of the seasons. It's a story about how one half of life is death. Everything that lives goes around and around the same glorious, terrible carousel. But how are we meant to understand the story and how are we meant to respond to it? Wikipedia is blunt and to the point. It says this is an origin story to explain the seasons, full stop. Okay, if we look at it on its most basic and obvious level, that seems to be true. The myth of Persephone tells a story. It's set in um, a time before human history when we have to assume there were no seasons. And it shows us through the interactions of anthropomorphized gods and goddesses how the present status quo came to exist, how seasons came into the world. But the people who first heard that story spoken, the people who told that story to each other, were a lot closer to the natural world than we are today. They were farmers. They lived in an agrarian society where the cycles of nature were the cycles of survival prosperity, they were the basis of a large part of civic order. You had to live by those cycles or else you didn't live at all. The ancient Greeks knew the seasons with an urgency and an immediacy that we, you know, we can't imagine now. So I'm tempted to ask at this point um, whether fish need an explanation for water or birds need an explanation for air. In winter, as the days grew shorter and the air grew colder, the people of ancient Greece knew on a very practical and visceral level what that meant. They'd seen the sun grow smaller, they'd seen the earth cool and the crops die as it moved away. And furthermore, they knew that their own lives and their children's lives depended on it coming back. So it seems to me that what you would want, what you would need in a situation like that, would not be an explanation. 
really. It would be a hotline. There would be a sense of a connection to that power so that when, it, when you prayed to it, you felt that it would listen. Okay, people aren't birds or fish. The medium through which we move, the world in which we live, is not invisible to our thoughts as, you know, as water is to fish. It's ever present and it's ever fascinating to us. We do go for, it, go for explanations, obviously we do. And so perhaps those early anthropologists were right, that in the absence of a scientific answer, we resort to etiological myths, myths of origin, to give us a handle on the world around us. Where do the seasons come from? Runaway blondes and pomegranate seeds. <laughs> but if ancient Greek culture is renowned for any one thing, it's for asking the tough questions. They laid down the bases for our modern sciences, for mathematics, for philosophy. They were very, very big on the pursuit of rational and observationally based explanations for the world around them. Plato proposed the theory of the dynamics of the celestial spheres. Later generations, building on his work, built stellar observatories and proposed ever more complex models for the perceived movements of the stars and the planets. So the existence of myth, which described earthly phenomena in terms of the interactions with gods, was never a barrier, as far as the Greeks were concerned, to investigations which tried to explain the world in terms of natural forces. The two things could exist side by side. So we come back, we keep coming back to the function of myth. And perhaps the myth of Persephone has less to do with explanation and more to do with analogy or alignment. There is a process in our own lives. We grow old and then we die. There is a process in the natural world. The seasons succeed each other. New life and growth are followed by death. Both of these processes reflect and are reflected by an event in the divine sphere. A goddess divides her time between the living world and the world of the dead. It's like those sets of gyroscopic gimbals that they used to get astronauts uh, accustomed to free fall. There's three, three sets of gimbals rotating in three dimensions, and as they move, the poor bastard inside them is spinning and spinning around in all three dimensions, dimensions at once. But if they all line up, the astronaut's standing upright. I think this is what myth does for us, and I think this is what stories that partake of myth do for us. They take a set of very disparate and contradictory parts and then they make a relationship between them. They make them relate to each other in a way that they didn't before. You've got movement in one dimension, which is our own lives, movement in a second dimension, the natural world, which is all around us, but separate from us. And then there's movement in a third dimension again, which is the supernatural and timeless realm of the gods. A myth puts those three levels of reality in alignment with each other. So we end up not with the sense that something has been explained to us, but that we ourselves have been relocated relative to the rest of the universe, that we've been taken from way over on the edge and put in the center where the action is, where it's all happening. We've been put back into the, into the world through the miracle of that emotional identification. The changes of the seasons are governed by the actions of a god, and a god is a human being writ large. So we look out into the world and we find ourselves already there, looking back at us. Wallace Stevens, if you haven't had enough of him already, um, often refers in his poetry to something which he calls the supreme fiction which is basically a story that can save your life. It shows up for the first time in the poems in the mid-30s, and then he just keeps on building it more and more, and finally most of his mature poetry is about this idea of the quest for the supreme fiction. And it seems like a paradox on the face of it, um, maybe a slightly annoying paradox. If you think about the etymology of the word fiction, it's a made thing from the Latin fingo fingere. Go back even further, and that same word means um, making an impression on wax or clay. So a fiction is quite literally the work of our own hands. It's something that we make and shape with a degree of conscious effort. It's not something that transcends us. It's something that comes from us. And it also, most times when it's used, fiction means a lie. Something that by its very different de definition isn't true. It's the opposite of truth. Third meaning of finger was to dissemble, to disguise the truth in order to deceive. So how can a lie save your life? And it can get you out of a tight spot, obviously. Um, the dog ate my homework. I did not have intercourse with that woman. <laughs> Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, so let's go get him. But how can it save your life? It's counterintuitive. Um, three possible answers to that question. The first one is the social Darwinist um, answer. There's a guy called Brian Boyd who wrote a book two years ago called On the Origin of Stories, um, which is a deliberate echo of Darwin's Origin of Species. Um, and what Boyer says is that basically storytelling evolves as an adaptive trait in human communities. It emerges and spreads and endures because it confers an evolutionary advantage. It helps us to survive and to get ahead of competition. 
he draws an analogy with play behaviors in animals. Uh, you know, when kittens are, are wrestling and doing that rough, rough and tumble stuff and pouring and clawing at each other, they're learning the behaviors, you know, the pouncing and the um, catching prey and so on, on which their adult lives will, will depend. But human life is more complicated than cats' lives. I have a cat, so I can say that. Uh, our, our cat's biggest problem in the course of the average day is getting enough rest in the gaps between meals so that he can walk, she can walk the food tray uh, when we fill it up. As human beings, we, we, we have a much more complex environment than that, and we have more complex needs. So we have a greater need than most animals do to extend our repertoire of possible responses to practice situations that we haven't met with yet, and to discover in a risk-free way what our options are. So according to Brian Boyd's argument, that's what stories are there to do. Fiction is cognitive play. Cognitive play with patterning, he calls it. And it prepares us, stories prepare us for life. Uh, in his words, narrative extends the kind, the depth, and the value of true information that we can have at our disposal. Stories are a toolkit, which are given to us when we're young, and then carried with us and developed by us through the whole of the rest of our lives. They're a priceless way of deciding which door you're going to walk through before the doors are even there in front of you. Um, another possible way in which lies can save your life, life is, is proposed by Kenneth Vonnegut in his 1963 novel, Cat's Cradle. This is the one where he invents the fake religion of Bokkanonism. According to his prophet, Bokkanon, there is nothing in the world that has any intrinsic meaning or value. God does have a plan, but he's not going to tell us what it is. Uh, we will fulfill it without even knowing that we fulfill it, and then we die, because he doesn't need us anymore, and then we're just dead. Um, but just because nothing is intrinsically true or meaningful, that doesn't mean that what we believe to be true is irrelevant. And this is where Vonnegut comes up with the wonderful concept of FOMA. FOMA are lies, but they're really useful lies. They're good, serviceable lies, which enable us to be happy with ourselves and the world we live in. They enable us to function and stay sane in a meaningless cosmos, um, allowing us to believe that things do make sense, that our lives do matter, that there's a point to the stuff we do. You might believe that you're doing some good in your job or that you're making a better world for your kids. It doesn't really matter what the lies are. What matters is they make life bearable. And Monica suggests that the premises of religions uh, are mostly lies of this kind, FOMA. They're never prov provably true. Uh, from a strictly rationalist perspective, they look like utter madness. But it doesn't matter whether they're true or not. Their truth value is superseded by their use value. Uh, and that's, what, that's, what, that's why we need them. Um, what's important is that they help us to deal with the appalling, random, meaningless crap that life is going to throw at us. Um, in an absurdist cosmos, the most you can do is, the most you can hope to do is to survive and maybe enjoy the ride. In Bokkanon's words, live by the lies that make you brave and kind and healthy and happy. Okay, so what do we have? Stories can help us to cope with real world problems in a pragmatic, survivalist sense by setting up a sort of test range for us. Brian Boyd. Or else they can help us to survive the psychological fallout from everyday existence and to maintain some kind of emotional stability in the face of the shitstorm that never ends. Kurt Vonnegut. But there's a third sense in which fictions can save us, and in some ways it's the most obvious one, the one we experience not just in odd moments of transcendence, but every day. Every time we read a story, every time we watch a movie, every time we go to the theatre or read a comic book or even tell a joke. I'm going to try to explain what I mean, and this is where it gets weird, so please bear with me. And remember that offer of remedial alcohol. Because <laughs> I'm going to go around in a big circle and creep up on you from an unexpected angle, and it might not be pleasant. <laughs> the hunger for story is something that we all know, and something that we experience from very, very early on in our lives. Kids can't get enough of stories, and the stories that they love, they will keep on asking for again and again. Sometimes they'll hear a story once, and as soon as you finish it, they'll say, again and they get really mad if you miss out a word or change a word because, you know, like the, the, the speaker in the Stevens poem, they know what they need and if you don't give it, to, give it to them, they demand it. That's how deep our need for story goes and that's how powerful it is. Like many British fantasy writers of my generation, I can divine, define very precisely the moment when I first got hooked on fantasy. I was five years old and during the free reading session, which was Tuesday afternoons at North Coast County Primary School, I discovered a book called The Magic Faraway Tree by Enid Blyton. Very, very badly written. Um, <laughs> in a penny plain style. Uh, three children, unfortunately named Dick, Fanny, and Connie. <laughs> find, find a huge tree in the woods.
woods near their house, and the tree's got magical properties. If you climb to the, there are people living in the tree, and there's a, there's a helter-skelter slide down the center of the tree. If you climb to the top of the tree, there's another world up, up in the topmost branches. And it's a different world every day. One day it might be a world where everything is edible, all the buildings and all the cars and the furniture. Uh, another day it's, it might be a world where things go by opposites. Black is white, white is wrong, day is night. Um, the kids can spend all day in that world exploring it and then discovering it to their heart's content. But if they're still there at the end of the day, if they don't make it back to the tree, the world rotates away from them. And a new world comes into place at the top of the tree. And if you're stuck in the old world, it's just gone. It might be years before you can get back. So that's the end of present threat. Um, to steal a great line from Shakespeare, that book hit me like a planet. It was the first story I'd ever come across with the power to rearrange the furniture inside my head, which I think is the power that's implicit in all stories. The world wasn't the same for me, even after I finished the book and put it down. There was something new in the world for me, a new potentiality, a new nuance, a new flavor, a new dimension. I was hungry for more, so I immediately went out and found all the sequels to that book. In fact, there are only three sequels. Uh, and then I found out that she'd also written some other fantasy stories called The, the Magic Wishing Chair. So I ate them up too. Uh, and then I discovered other fantasists who wrote in a kid-friendly style, George MacDonald, Mary Norton, um, Alison Utley, Beverly Nichols, um, Lewis Carroll. And as I grew older, I still stayed with those themes. My teen years were dominated by Michael Moorcock, Ashton Le Guin, Rogers Lasney, Merlin Peake. And given the shape of my career so far, I think I can say that finding that book at the age of five was a life-changing experience. But it didn't really confer any evolutionary advantage on me to look at it from Brian Boyd's point of view. And it didn't give me a template for living that made my own existence more bearable or made me better adjusted to living it. It just threw a hand grenade into my imagination. There was nothing practical I could do with the results of that. It was just, it was just there for me. Our love affair with the lies of fiction goes right back to our earliest childhood, to our personal origin points as human beings. Fantasy, imagination, counterfactuals, let's pretends, hypotheses, whimsies, digressions. These things are not add-ons to our experience. They are the very foundation of our experience. We can't live in the real world for two minutes together, as Peter demonstrated so eloquently this morning. But we behave as though we do, as though the real world is where we live, and as though it's a virtue to live in the real world. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I felt as a child, I thought as a child. Now that I am become a man, I have put away childish things. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's hear it for St. Paul. Um, no? Okay, fine. I would like to give the last word on that subject to Gene Wolfe, who in the book of the New Sun has Severian, his protagonist, realized that when you stop being a child, you don't become something different and better, you just stop being a human being. What do we know about children? We know that from pretty much the first moment when they come into the world, they instinctively look for the part of the world that is most like themselves, right? They look for faces. And when they find something that resembles a face, even if it's just two dots and then a vertical line and then a horizontal line, they lock right onto it. They have a powerful physiological response to that pattern. It's part of our basic kit to have that response. Parents spend long hours looking down at their newborn babies, making faces, making silly noises, and the babies eat that shit up. They can't get enough of it. The baby stares right back at you, watching your expression, listening to those sounds, taking notes as they go along, because that's how they learn to be human. That's how they learn um, the sounds of language. It's how they learn the basic emotional responses and so on. It's like the human face is the download button. And newborn babies already know, come into the world knowing that that's where they need to go to get the real deal about being human. And it's such a powerful instinct that you can't turn it off again later on in your life when it's become an embarrassment. That's why people find the face of Christ in a potato, um, <laughs> or Satan in that photo of the smoke from the nuclear explosion, or Snoopy the dog and Lucy Van Pelt in two mountains in northern Arizona. Because we keep on looking for pattern, and we specifically we keep on looking for that pattern, for the pattern of humanity, the pattern of our own faces. And this is what happens on a larger scale when we visit the world of stories. What is it more than anything else that makes stories distinct from other collections of words? Stories describe events, okay? They describe linked sequences of events, but you can, you can do that without making a story out of it. This is from a website called Science Aid. Light hits the thylakoid membrane. 
At that point, the light energy is converted into chemical energy. Chlorophyll and several other pigments, such as beta carotene, organizing clusters in the thylakoid membrane, react to the incoming light. Each of these differently colored pigments absorbs a different color, etc. Were you thrilled? <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you imagine Matt Damon playing the thylakoid membrane? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> stories, stories are different from other collections of words because they've got people in them, or they've got other entities that stand in for people. They are descriptions of events happening to characters. Sometimes the storyteller has to go through some pretty extreme contortions in order to provide the characters. That's to anthropomorphize animals, or natural forces, mountains, or rivers, or whatever. But that is how stories work, and it's part of the secret of the power that stories hold over us, that what they give back to us in exchange for our time and our attention is ultimately ourselves. We're like those babies looking for something that's vaguely shaped like a face, and as soon as we find it, we're hypnotized. There's a, a British sci-fi comic, 2000 AD. It's pretty much the only surviving British comic. It's been around for a long time now, more than 30 years. And its most successful character, and its longest running character in terms of continuous presence in the comic is Judge Dredd, who is um, a tough, hard-boiled cop in a dysfunctional future society. He's also a judge, jury, and executioner. If you've committed a crime, he can just kill you on the street, and it's all cool. Um, the interesting thing about Dredd is that the guys who created him, John Wagner and Pat Mills, intended him to be a monster. Um, they, they were writing during the rise to power of Margaret Thatcher, and they could see the way the whole of British society was lurching terrifyingly to the right. And they thought, we'll make a story out of that. That's, that's kind of a cool backdrop for a story. But they expected people to be horrified by Dredd. And they were appalled to find that actually people liked Dredd. So they thought, well, we'll just make him a bigger bastard then. We'll, just, well, we'll make him kill people for no provocation whatsoever. And the more they did it, the more they piled on that horror, the more people thought, wow, Dread is cool. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the urge to emotionally identify with the protagonist was so strong, there was nothing they could do to shake them off. Um, <laughs> Wagner describes it as like you know, trying to get rid of a dog or something in leg. They could not make the reader dissociate from the character. Uh, the same thing happens to Johnny Spate with the character Alf Garner in the comedy Till Death Was Dupar, a horrible, abusive racist who um, threatens his wife with violence, his passive, underplaying wife with violence. And again, people thought he was lovable. He's not. He's drawn without a single sympathetic trait. But the urge to identify was still there. Um, Bertolt Brecht went out of his way to sabotage that process of emotional identification. The whole point of Brecht's plays was to, to distance the audience emotionally from the unfolding story. But people go to the threatening opera and they still stubbornly insist on identifying either with Maki, who was a murderer and a rapist, um, or with Pirate Jenny, who fantasizes about slaughtering everybody she knows. Um, like the babies again, looking up at our gurning mummy and daddy, we look for our own face in the story, we look for the emotional attachment point, and we keep on looking until we find it most of the time, uh, or make it if it's not there already. Assuming I'm right about this, and this is, this is a feature of, of our response to all stories, and it provides a partial answer to the question of why stories matter to us. Whether they work in the fantastic mode or not, stories are always alien worlds with familiar inhabitants. They're landscapes with figures. We enter them, and we find ourselves at home, no matter how weird the surroundings may be. And maybe that gives us a handle on why the earliest human societies told intense, urgent, powerful stories about the world around them, and then sanctified and solemnized those stories as myths. The world is a scary place and an alien place, a forbidding place. So you find the human pattern, you find the part of it that looks a little bit like you, and you hold on to it desperately. In Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons' Watchmen, which was considered by Terry Gilliam to be the war and peace of comic books, John Osterman, Dr. Manhattan, asked the question, who makes the world? And there are various answers that are suggested in the book. Um, one of them, possibly the one that sticks, is that we all do all the time. We make the world. And this is obviously true, not just in a kind of distant, abstract, zen, transcendental sense, the sense of occasional bursts of enlightenment. It's true in the day-to-day -day sense of who we are and where we live. Professor B.S. Ramachandran, a lecturer in neuroscience at the University of California, San Diego, has been studying and writing about the origins of introspective consciousness. Up to two and a half million years ago, he says, human brains did not have the capacity to reflect on themselves, to be aware of their own nature and contents. We were already pretty smart animals, the smartest on the street, but we didn't have that extra bootstrapping faculty of being able to look at our own thought processes, uh, being able to take a step back and uh, have a model for ourselves within our minds. 
But what evolves two, two and a half million years ago then is this, this, this sense of self, the idea of self as a counter that you can, you can put, put into equations in your mind and feed out solutions. It'll, and it's a very, very powerful and useful tool. It allows us to assess our needs, our interior states, our happiness or unhappiness, our future happiness or unhappiness. And therefore it allows us a much greater uh, flexibility of action. And Professor Ramachandran, this is where it gets kind of mind-bending for me, he believes that our sense of self has a shape in the same way that our DNA has a shape. DNA has the shape of a double helix. The sense of self, he argues, has the shape of a story. In his words, you take all the things that have ever happened to you and you stitch them together into a general abstract idea. Me, our idea of self, is really a story that we tell ourselves. And he points out that our actions are really not particularly, for most of us, they're not consistent, either over time or with the way we view ourselves, with our self-image. We think we're honest, but we tell lies. We think we're kind, but we do cruel things. We think we're rational, but in a million ways, every day, we let irrational impulses dictate what we do. We're mostly quite crazy, inchoate, chaotic beings. But in order to function, we have to believe that there is a common thread running through our actions and that this thread is us. That there is a thinking, unchanging subject, a thinking, unchanging me behind everything that I do. However inexplicable the things I do may be. We edit out the parts that don't fit or we explain them away. We paper over the cracks because we have to. We can't function as people without doing that elementary surgery. And this is why we need the story of self. Like a child, saying, you know, tell it this way, don't put that word in, put this word in. We want to hear the same story over and over, and the story is us. I want to hear the tale of my Carrie and you, well, you know your own names. <laughs> the story of your life, as in the Ted Chang short story of that title, is actually coterminous with your life. It is your life. You tell it and you enact it at the same time. And it makes sense because it's a story. It has story logic. So you ignore the inconsistencies because you're so absorbed by the tale. We're all aware of that little voice inside our head, speaking our thoughts and our intentions, what's happening to us and how we feel about it. And what Professor Ramachandran is saying is, that little voice, that's you. That's all the you there is. The rest is just make-believe. And if he's right, if we are fundamentally made of story, to the same extent that we're made of flesh and blood, then what happens when we read other stories is something akin to sex. We allow those stories to touch ours and to entwine with ours and they enter us and they become us. Another piece of research from another American university, Buffalo, New York, which is just down the road from here, suggests that immediately after reading a book, your responses to questions and hypothetical scenarios are changed. You actually respond a little bit more like the protagonist of the book that you've just read. So if you consume the adventures of Harry Potter, you become a little bit like Harry Potter, or like Ron, or Hermione, or Dumbledore, your fictional alter ego of choice. So we kind of come around in a big circle. T.S. Eliot said that we live in the wasteland. Wallace Stevens said that we live in our own minds, exiles from reality, living in a state of poverty. Those two statements seem to be very familiar, very similar, but actually they're not. If we do live in our own minds, then it's up to us whether or not we pine for any other motherland or fatherland, any other place that we feel we need to be. We can quest like Tennyson's Ulysses did until the quest consumes us and we die. Or we can simply accept that this, this strange space furnished with ideas, is actually our home. We can have the experience of seeing the wasteland flower like a garden. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. And all those myths that put a human face on the seasons, on the thunder, on the sun, they were telling us the exact and literal truth. The world we live in is the world we make in our own heads from moment to moment. It's the story that we tell ourselves about our own adventures with the moral that we give it, or else no moral at all. Can you bear one more Wallace Stevens book? Yes. <laughs> okay. This is Tea at the Palace of Hoon, 1923. Not less because in purple I descended the western day through what you called the loneliest air, not less was I myself. What was the ointment sprinkled on my beard? What were the hymns that buzzed beside my ears? What was the sea whose tide swept through me there? Out of my mind the golden ointment rained, and my ears made the blowing hymns they heard. I was myself the compass of that sea. 
I was the world in which I walked, and what I saw or heard or felt came not but from myself, and there I found myself more truly and more strange. Modern mythologies are the same as ancient mythologies in that they give us this sense of being restored to ourselves, having our emptiness filled, having our poverty annulled. It may be illusion, but who cares? Everything else is illusion too. The streets we walk down are a dream. The houses that we live in are clouds and shadows. The mind, to use Ursula Le Guin's phrase, is the lathe of heaven on which our salvation is beaten out. We read because we are people made out of words. And all stories, in the end, are costumes, dazzling or dark, that we choose to wear. I'm pretty much done, but let me leave you with one more tiny piece of fantasy by Lord Dunsany again. It's from the same book, Gods of Pagana. These lines are spoken by one of the smallest of Dunsany's gods, Limpang Tung, the god of mirth and of melodious minstrels, the kind of guy who, in heaven, misses all the memos and never gets the keys to the executive washroom. <laughs> <laughs> and Limpang Tung said, the ways of the gods are strange. The flower groweth up and the flower fadeth away. This may be very clever of the gods. Man groweth from his infancy, and in a while he dieth. This may be very clever too, but the gods play with a strange scheme. Go out into the starry night, and Limpang Tung will dance with thee, who danced since the gods were young, or offer up a jest to Limpang Tung. Only pray not in thy sorrow to Limpang Tung, for he saith of sorrow, it may be very clever of the gods, but it doesn't understand it. I hope you'll take the last three quarters of an hour in the spirit, something offered up to Limpang Tung to while away the time, I hope, pleasantly. And if not, find me in the bar, whisper the magic words, I was with you in Toronto. <laughs> and you can at least drink away the memory. Thank you. Myths from oral traditions and myths. Visual mediums, textual mediums, and oral tradition. And in terms of our responses to them, in terms of how they affect us, I, I, I would suspect that the, um, the the medium in this case is not the message. So we would probably have very very similar responses um, to all of it. Why do you do you feel that there is a difference? In terms of how we perceive. And, uh, in terms of how we respond. morning was that we're using uh, very similar parts of our, our brain to process the input from different sensory data, that it all basically turns into the same kind of kind of impulse by the time it's internalized. So um, I'm going to stick with that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have the answer to evasion. Um, how would you address the actual need to create material as opposed to consuming and reading it? Um, what should we do with the I think, I think they overlap enormously. Um, you know, to some extent, you, you, you write and you make stories in the same way. Did you, did you ever have the, 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 the sort of conscious dreaming thing where you're lying in bed trying to get to sleep and so you, you'll have fantasy adventures in your mind? I think to some extent when you write a story, um, you're, you're doing something like that. You're writing a story that you want to, you're consuming it at the same time as you're creating it. But I think also those, the, what, was, what was your phrase for this morning about I'm making you all my pictures? Um, <laughs> I love, I love storytelling. More and more and more, my, my, my favorite experience, well, maybe my second favorite experience, is, is, doing, is, doing, is doing public readings. I, I, I really, really love, um, sort of like, um, you know, the analogy I draw there about sex. L l making your story become kind of like uh, a, pleasurable, a pleasurable experience for other people is a fantastic feeling, it really is. Um, so I think it's, it's a combination of those two impulses. Um, so if storytelling is kind of like sex, can storytelling also be like rape? And is there a kind of ethics of storytelling? 
there is an ethics of storytelling. Um, somebody said this morning, was it, it was Daniel, I think. Uh, um, you have to be really careful about this, because once the story's left you and it's out in the world, you're, you, you can't bring it back again. So you are responsible for the stories that you tell. Um, and I have told stories that I'm not 100% proud of um, at, at earlier stages of my career, you know, when you'll do anything for the money. <laughs> One of them was uh, a comic book retailing the adventures of the heavy metal band Pantera. Um, <laughs> fortunately, nobody bought it. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think it sold like three copies, and two of those I bought myself. Um, it was based on a four-page synopsis that um, Phil Anselmo, the lead singer, put together. And the synopsis went like this. Evil vampires kidnap the heavy metal band Pantera, and they torture them. And then there were three pages describing the torches. <laughs> and they, they put matches underneath our fingernails, and then they light the matches. Uh, and they score us with razor blades. But do we care? No, because we are men, and we are strong, we, we endure. And then we beat the asses of the, uh, of the vampire. And I wrote the story, and I, actually, I, put, I put a, a character in the story who was a Hispanic woman, and I was told to take her out again because the core audience were white males. So, and I, I, I didn't take her out, but I did, I downgraded her part in the story, for which I am ashamed. You know, it, was, it was a crappy story. Um, so, I th I th yeah, I think the rape analogy holds. I think there are stories that, um, that do violence to the listener, definitely. And not just by virtue of being lies. You know, you, you can sort of, you can misrepresent the world in a lot of really subtle and really fucked up ways in stories, if you're, if you're not careful, just through um, neglect rather than through actual malice or intention. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, I think I agree. Anyone? Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I don't agree. Oh, okay. I would wonder if the <laughs> trouble would just be that the stories can be a really, really bad lay. It's <laughs> 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 in the sense that rape implies a lack of choice. And your typical narrative is something that somebody can always put down if they find it too offensive or too. I mean, until we come to that, that wonderful time when we can actually. Force people to read our story. There is, there is, you're, you're absolutely right, but there is such a thing as informed consent. Um, you, were, you were talking about um, pedophiles, uh, something in some ways having a, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'm trying to paraphrase what you said, something about pedophiles, but um, <laughs> there, is a reason, there is a reason why it's illegal to have sex with children, because even if you get them to say yes, it's not informed consent, it's still a crime, it's still, it's still, it's still an imposition, it's still a rape. You know, sometimes consent is not consent, arguably. Uh, this guy. Uh, throwing you the softball question you asked for. Can you oh, just a about that oh Barfield, thank you. I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> Barfield was amazing. He wrote this book called Poetic Diction, um, and it was about the origins of myths in the origins of language. Um, at the time when he was writing, which is like late 1930s, early 1940s, the prevalent um, theory of the origin of language was Jespersen's, Otto Jespersen's theory, which was that um, languages start with concretes, they start with words that mean physical things or physical actions. And then gradually, they, they accrete metaphors, metaphorical layers of meaning, which allow them to refer to, um, to you know, ideas in our, in our heads and abstract concepts. Um, so you, you, don't, you don't think about physical weight when you ponder something, but that's what it originally meant. And you don't think about looking at the stars when you consider something, but that's what it originally meant. So languages are made out of dead metaphors. Um, and Barfield said, no, that's wrong because it assumes that primitive men have the same, primitive humans have the same thought processes that we do, and dissected the world in the same ways. Um, and he claims that there was a period of linguistic unity. There was a time when um, one and the same word could refer, without, without there being any kind of elision of meaning, could refer to interior and exterior realities. He could see the example of the Latin spiritus, meaning both wind and breath, and then life, because breath is the sign of life, and then soul, because all living things have one. And it means all those things at one and the same time. And he says that myths are created at that point in the, in the development of language when you can use these incredibly potent multi-layered signs and mean everything at once. Um, I was talking about this to my daughter, Lou, who is ferociously clever. Um, she's a bright spark in the family. And she said there's a great example of that from an Anglo-Saxon poem, Dream of the Root which is a, a, an epic poem spoken by the cross on which Christ died. It's the cross telling us the story of Christ's death. But at the start, the, 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 the human poet says, you know, I, I, dreamt, I dreamt I saw the cross and the cross was talking to me. And what he says was, I dreamt I saw a great tree in the sky, Treal. 
But the word tree didn't just mean tree, it also meant oath, promise, covenant. So I saw, I saw the bar, I saw a great truth in the sky, I saw the bargain between God and man in the sky, and I saw a tree in the sky, and it meant all those things at the same time. So Barfield says, myths can only really be created at the point where interior and exterior worlds um, are represented by the same symbol. It's a, it's a hell of a book. I have no idea whether it's true, but it's a hell of a book. We have 10 minutes. Uh, one, thing you, you know, one thing that I've always seen in fiction that you didn't touch upon was the idea of um, fiction as a means for self-revelation on the part of the reader. I mean, I, I can give you a very good example. I've got a friend of mine who was born to immense wealth to a family that abused that wealth and read a Spider-Man comic when he was five years old and felt with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> and it actually literally completely changed his life. I mean, you know, I, I, I wonder if you Well, yeah, no, totally, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, um, you're right, I didn't, I didn't specifically say it, but I, I, I think it's implied by what I was saying, you know, that basically, that, 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 that if our lives are made up of words, if ourselves are made up of words, that the words that we take into our head become a part of us, they're incorporated into us, whether we like it or not. So, yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, some of the most profound experiences of my life have been uh, when I was reading books, um, revelations that come to me through books. So just following up on that, that's true and you're conscious of it and you want to be something different than you perceive yourself as being, can you seek out or possibly create fiction that will change you? I don't know. Um, I certainly wouldn't bet against it. Um, I, I have a, a sort of a very um, wary attitude to self-help books. Because <laughs> I think most of them, you know, well, um, my wife has a, a stepbrother um, who went to a, a self-help seminar with one of these, these gurus who charges, you know, $1,000 a pop and says he will turn your life around in three days. And Justin came back and said, my life was turned around in three days. And it was for three weeks. <laughs> and then he went back to being Justin again. And he hated himself. He hated himself for backsliding and not embedding all of these, these great new um, skills and techniques in his life. So I think the answer is yes, but it's not easy or immediate or obvious or, or automatic. But it might have been, you know, if someone had told him go and read the book of the new sun for three days, that he could have been on the deepest of the sun. Yeah, I think, I think it just doesn't, it doesn't happen um, according to a conscious agenda that we set. I think it happens all the time, but it happens in ways that we can't monitor, can't, or, or, or you know, can't, can't predict, can't control. Any other questions? I tend to agree with Tolkien about the Narnia books. Um, I, I loved them when I read them um, like in my early teens, and now I read them and I can't enjoy them in the same way because um, who was it who said we hate art that has too palpable a design upon us? But it's like that. You know that Lewis is setting traps for you, and it, annoy, like, it annoys me. I, I, I just can't read it with an innocent eye anymore. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm on Tolkien's side at that, that argument.
if your your stories were false faces. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know, I just want to float that out there because I think the question of misrepresentation of story, of narrative rape, I think it's out there or we wouldn't have such a fine defense of I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, an example that sticks in my mind is um, who wrote this film? The Bulgari, the Bulgari affair. Is it Faye Weldon? Yes. yes. It is. Yes. Faye Weldon was approached by a company that, that makes diamond jewelry and was asked, you know, if we, if we slip you 5,000 quid, will you mention our product five times in the course of the story? And she said, I'll do better than that. I'll build an entire novel around your product. And she did. The, the Bulgari affair or the Bulgari effect or something. Um, and that struck me when I read about it. I, I just couldn't, uh, I, I was angry for days. I was sort of punching the wall because um, it seemed to me to be introducing a third party into what ought to be the one-to-one -one relationship between you and the writer. And I know that's bullshit um, on, on one level because there are always other parties involved in that, in that relationship. There are publishers, um, there are you know, agents, there are you know, any, any number of other people who kind of have a, have a say in, what, in the stories that do get told and don't get told. But I hate feeling that I'm being sold to somebody else through a story. I just can't live with that, that knowledge. So I, I didn't take Faye Walden seriously as a novelist after that. I thought it was a kind of foul thing to do. Along well, that same point, then, if we're talking along with fiction as a propaganda piece, then, such as something like, you know, perhaps a little Belgian or Potemkin or, you know, anything like that that's actually trying to sell you that message. That but, that, but that's okay if you take because it to account. more honest. But if, yeah, if you take it to account what Leia said, so long as it sets itself up. As that story, then you're not cheated. You know, it's only if it, if it, you know, if it tries to be something else, and it tries to hide. Like you have, you have story you're telling, and underneath that is the message you're jamming down the person's throat. Yeah. So like um, the Chandler Mabel novels are based on a, you know, he's, he's, he's a card-carrying communist, and he's portraying a, a, a communist vision of of European history. Um, I don't mind that at all. Not not only because I, mean, I agree with an awful lot of the things he's saying, but also. He's completely upfront about it. He's not trying to, trying to cheat you or lie to you or anything. Just sort of along the same line, I mean, it's kind of interesting to see people's frustration with so much politics, and, and part of that can be argued is because many of the many of the platforms are posed that are posed as the story of how we want to govern, and then the subsequent execution of that story there's this huge disconnect. So, so the bullshit detector goes off, and I mean that's the root of the rent, right? You just like yeah. We we just we just elected um, a government. The the deputy prime minister said in um, most of his campaign speeches, we will abolish tuition fees for university students. Gets into power, triples tuition fees for university students, and says, well, I wish we lived in the world where I could keep my promises, but we don't. <laughs> and we have to go. Thank you so much. Uh,